Music clefs are symbols that are used in sheet music to indicate the range of the written notes. They are placed at the beginning of a staff. The treble clef is used for higher pitched instruments and represents higher range of notes. Bass clef is used for lower pitched instruments. It represents the lower range of notes. There are seven letter names in music notes, starting from A, they are A, B, C, D, F, G. For example, on the piano, each letter name represents one key. After the note G, letter names repeat in a loop. Let's start with the five line staff before we get into reading music notes. The five horizontal lines represent different pitches of musical notes. The top line is the highest pitch, and the bottom line symbolizes the lowest pitch. To remember the notes on the lines of the treble clef staff, you can use mnemonics like Every good boy deserves fudge. To remember the notes on the space, face is an easy mnemonic to recall the notes. At this point, let's talk about ledger lines. When notes are too high or too low to be notated on a staff, ledger lines are used to extend the staff. Now let's get back to read the bass clef. F represents different pitches than the notes on the treble clef staff. The top line is also the highest pitch, and the bottom line represents the lowest pitch. To remember the notes on the bass clef staff, you can use mnemonics like good boys do fine always, to remember the notes on the spaces. All cows eat grass. Now let's look at some exercises of music notes on the five line staff. See if you can spot them. We'll start with treble clef. Usually we have two systems to name the note value. Both the British way and the American way are commonly used. Imagine there is a very big cake that represents a semibrieve or whole note. Now, I am going to share this cake with two people, which we call a minim, or half note. If the cake is shared by four people, each segment becomes a crotchet or quarter note. At this point, you can make a guess of the next note value, which should be a quaver or eighth note, because the cake will be shared by eight people. And then there are 16 people to share the cake, that is semi-quaver or 16th note. When there are 32 people to share the cake, that becomes demi semi quaver or 32nd note. The next will be 64th note, in British English is hemidemi semi quaver. I hope you all remember it. We will further discuss it afterwards. Now, let's have a quiz. First, let's talk about note values. Remember in lesson 1, we have talked about each note representing a certain duration of time, and we measure that time in beats. The most common note values are the semi brieve which receives four beats. The minim is given two beats. Crotchet is one beat. The quaver is half a beat long and the semi-quaver is a quarter of one beat. Let's discuss rhythmic patterns now. It is a pattern of sound and silence, which is created by combining different note values. For example, you can create a simple rhythmic pattern made up of minims and crotchet, and presents like this. Let's listen to how the sound is. Let's try more rhythmic patterns. This one is made up of crotchets and quavers. The following is created with the combination of crotchets, quavers, and semi-quavers. Notice how the rhythm changes when we add in different note values? This is the foundation of all music, and once you understand note values and rhythmic patterns, you'll be able to play any piece of music you want. 
Now, it's your turn. Let's get a piece of paper and start dictating some rhythmic patterns together. Try your best and see if you can write them correctly. I will play each pattern twice. Each exercise will be in 4-4 four, four time. Are you ready? Let's get started now. Rests are just as important as notes in music, as they help to give us a sense of space and timing. So, let's dive in. A rest is a musical symbol that indicates a moment of silence or a pause in the music. Just like notes, they have different symbols and represent different lengths of silence. To identify musical rests, both the British and American terms are commonly used. Let's go over the different types of rests. Semi-breathe rest or whole rest. This rest looks like a rectangle that hangs from the fourth line of the staff. It represents four beats of silence in 4-4 four, four time. Sometimes semi-breathe is used as a whole bar rest. Here you can see the example is in 3-4 time. The whole bar rest is used, representing three-quarter beats. Minim rest or half rest. This rest is located on the third line of the staff. It means two beats of silence in 4-4 four, four time. Whole rest and half rest can be easily confused. Imagine the whole rest as a fluorescent tube with four rays of light shining through it. Half rest looks like a gentleman hat. Remember, there are two eyes underneath. Well, those are just two analogies to help you remember it easily. Crotchet rest or quarter rest. This rest looks like a fancy Z and sits on the second line of the staff. It represents one quiet beat in 4-4 four, four time. Quaver rest or eighth rest. This rest resembles a small 7. It represents half a beat of silence in 4-4 four, four time. Semi-quaver rest and 16th rest. This rest looks like a small S. It represents a quarter of a beat of silence in 4-4 four, four time. Now quiz time. Well done. You now have a better understanding of rests and how they contribute to music notation. Remember, rests are just as important as notes, so always pay attention to them when reading or playing music. Today we're going to learn about dotted rhythm, 
Let's define it first. A dotted rhythm is one in which each note is followed by a dot. The dot after the note extends the length of the note by half of its original value. Let's take a dotted minimum note as an example. A dotted minimum note is equal to three beats. Since a minimum note is worth two beats, the dot adds another crotchet beat, which makes it equal to three beats. Another example is the dotted crotchet note. A dotted crotchet note is equal to one and a half beats. Since a crotchet note is one beat long, the dot adds another half beat to make it 1.5 crotchet beats long. The dotted rhythm applies to rests as well. For example, a dotted minimum rest is worth three beats in 4-4 four, four time. Now it's time to get some practice. There are two exercises below. You can check the answer after each exercise. To start, let's define what a tie note is. A tie is a curved line connecting two notes of the same pitch. When two notes are tied together, the duration of both notes combined and played as one note. For example, let's say we have one semi-breve and one minim. If we tie these two notes together with a curved line, we create a new note that lasts for six crotchet beats. It is very important to remember that both notes should be in the same pitch, and you only play the note once. Don't get confused with tie note and slur. The tie links two notes of the same pitch, whereas the slur connects two or more different notes to indicate that they should be played smoothly without any separation. Let's listen to some examples. Another example. A tie note can occur both across and within a bar. When it is difficult to explain certain note value with one single note, tie note can be used. Take a look in this example. The note value is difficult to explain with one single note, so we use a tie to notate it. Both notes merge together as 2.5 beats long. When a tie joins two notes with an accidental placed on the first note, the second note is also affected by the accidental, even across a bar line. In the above example, the first note is also a C-sharp in the second bar. That's all for our lesson on tie notes. Accidental notes are notes that have been slightly altered and are not part of the key signature. Therefore, they need to be marked with a symbol. Now, let's start with the three types of accidentals. The first one is known as a sharp which is indicated by a hashtag-like symbol. A sharp raises the pitch of a note by a semitone. For example, if we have a C note and we put a sharp sign before it, it becomes a C-sharp, which is one semitone higher than a C. The second type of accidental is a flat, indicated by a symbol resembling the letter B. A flat lowers the pitch of a note by a semitone. For example, if we take an A note and add a flat sign before it, it becomes an A-flat, which is one semitone lower than an A. The third type of accidental is called a natural. A natural cancels the effect of any accidental that occurs before the natural sign. For example, if we have a C-sharp note and we place a natural sign before it, it becomes a C-natural, which is back to its original pitch. Remember that accidental is only effective within one bar. All the other notes with the same pitch are affected afterwards within the same bar. See the following example. Now, let's discuss where accidentals are placed. Accidentals come before the note they are modifying. For example, if we want to play a C-sharp note, we write the symbol sharp before the note C. However, if we just write the letter C-sharp on a passage, not writing it on the five-line staff, the symbol should go after the letter like this. 
Lastly, let's talk about double sharps and double flats. A double sharp is indicated by the symbol that looks like a X, and it raises the pitch of a note by two semitones. For example, if you put a double sharp symbol before C, it becomes D. A double flat is indicated by the symbol likes two Bs sticking together, and it lowers the pitch of a note by two semitones. For example, if you put a double flat after the note G, it becomes F notes in different positions on the staff are not affected by one another's accidentals. For example, the third note is a D natural here. The second flat on has no effect on it, because the pitch is not the same. It's an octave higher. So there you have it. This is the end of this lesson. In this tutorial, we will go through the basics of time signatures and how they work. So, what exactly is a time signature? Time signature is usually found at the beginning of a piece of music and is represented by two numbers, one on top of the other. The upper one tells the number of beats in a measure, and the lower one indicates type of note value that receives one beat. In lesson one, we have mentioned types of note value, for example, semi brief, minim, crotchet, quaver, and semi quaver. Now let's take a look at some common time signatures. 4-4 four, four time. This is the most common time signature in music. It means that there are four beats in a measure and each beat equals to a crotchet. Now let's listen to an example in 4-4 four, four time. Three four time. This time signature means that there are three beats in a measure and the crotchet receives one beat. Here is an example of three four time. Two four time. This time signature means that there are two beats in a measure and each beat means a crotchet. Let's listen to an example of 2-4 time. 2-4 So, that's a brief introduction to time signatures. Now, let's see if you can identify the time signature of the following except. Keep in mind, the number on the top of the time signature tells us how many beats are in each measure, and the number on the bottom tells us what kind of note value gets one beat. I will play each except twice.
Let's start with the bar line. The bar line is a vertical line that divides music into equal measures or bars. Each bar represents a fixed number of beats. The purpose of dividing music into bars is to organize music in a better way, so that musicians can read and play music more efficiently by breaking it down into smaller, manageable sections. To better understand the importance of bar lines, let's take a look at an example. Here's a piece of music without any bar lines. As you can see, the music lacks any sense of structure. It's difficult to read and play for musicians. Now, let's add some bar lines and see how it changes. With the addition of bar lines, the music now has a clear sense of rhythm and structure. It seems like that is easier to read and play. However, the score will look even better if notes are beamed as groups of beats. Now, let's talk about beaming. It is a horizontal line that connects notes together. Notes which are smaller than crotchets, such as quavers and semiquavers, have tails attached to them. To make it easier to read, we join all tails together with a horizontal line, which makes it easier to read. Take a look at these quaver notes. Note with one tail have one beam. We can beam these notes like this. Note with two tails have two beams and should be connected like this. Notes with different numbers of tails can be grouped like this. In conclusion, the bar line and the beaming are essential elements of music notation that play a crucial role in creating rhythm and structure. Understanding the purpose of bar lines and beaming allows musicians to read and play music more efficiently, while composers can create more logical and structured compositions. If we have a series of notes that are played in quick succession, it would be uneasy to read each note separately. That's where beams come in. Beams are horizontal lines that connect notes to indicate that they are played as a group. For example, here's a series of quaver notes without beams. It should be written like this. A series of semi-quaver notes should be written like this. It's important to note that beams should be used to group notes that are played within the same beat, usually to make the beat unit obvious. If the notes are played over different beats, then we should use separate beams or simply write the notes separately. Beams cannot cross the bar lines. For example, the following music is in 4-4 time. The note beaming is correct since it shows an obvious strong and weak beat relationship. The music looks clean and neat in this case. Now let's take a look at another example. This one is incorrect because it weakens the importance of the third beat, which is a second strong beat in 4-4 time. In 3-4 time, beaming is right in the following example. Note that a series of six quavers notes should be beamed like this, not like this. Rests can be included within a group of beamed notes, for example like this one. Tones and semitones, sometimes known as whole step and half step in American terms, are the building blocks of Western music. They form the basis of scales, chords, and melodies. A semitone is the shortest distance between two adjacent notes whether on a piano keyboard or a guitar fretboard. For example, from E to F, it is impossible to insert one more note between E to F. Let's take a look at another example of semitone. Here you can see it is impossible to squeeze one more note between G and F sharp, so that it is a semitone. A whole tone equals two semitones. For example, the picture below shows two notes from G to A we can squeeze a G-sharp or A-flat between them. There are two semitones here from G to G-sharp, and then G-sharp to A. Now let's do some exercises to review the concept of whole tone and semitone. Today, we're diving into the major scales and scale degrees. Major scales are a fundamental concept in music theory. They consist of a specific pattern of eight notes. Each letter name appears only once. The first and the last note are the same. The first note of a major scale is called the tonic. For example, in this C major scale, the first note C is the tonic. It serves as the foundation for the scale and determines its name. To form a scale, 
We need to know the distance between each of the notes in the scale. The distance will be either a tone or semitone. In this C major scale, the distance between each note is like this. From C to D, it is a whole tone. D to E is a whole tone. E to F is a semitone. F to G is a whole tone. G to A is a whole tone. A to B is a whole tone. B to C is a semitone. We then form a scale pattern like this. Whole tone, whole tone, semitone, whole tone, whole tone, whole tone, semitone. Remember this formula. You can then build up a scale starting from any note. For example, in this G major scale, the formula is the same. Remember the seventh note has to be F sharp, not G flat, because we've already got a G in the scale. Each letter name can appear only once. We have just built up the scale. And now we need to know the name of each scale degree. Each degree has its unique role and function. The tonic, as the first degree, establishes the tonal center and provides a sense of stability. The supertonic, mediant, subdominant, and dominant degrees contribute to the harmonic and melodic structure of the scale, adding tension, resolution, and movement. The submediant and leading tone complete the scale, with the leading tone creating a strong desire to resolve back to the tonic. Understanding major scales and scale degrees is crucial for musicians, as they provide a framework for creating melodies, harmonies, and chord progressions. By recognizing and utilizing scale degrees, musicians can navigate through different tonalities, create expressive melodies, and craft harmonically rich compositions. In this tutorial, we will take a look at some basic key signatures of C, G, D, F major. Key signatures are musical notations that tell us which notes are frequently used in a piece of music. When we write music that mainly uses notes from the C major scale and ends with a C, then we can say that the music is in C major. The key signature of C major contains no sharp or flat, making it the simplest key signature. Let's listen to music in C major. Now let's move on to G major. When we write music that mainly uses notes from the G major scale, that is G, A, B, C, D, E, and F sharp, the piece is then identified as in G major. There is a F sharp in G major scale. Instead of writing all the Fs with sharp signs throughout the piece, we just need to write one sharp at the beginning, right after the clef, to indicate that all Fs should be F sharps. For example, the following music was written in G major, because it starts and ends with G. If the score is presented without key signature, there are so many F sharps throughout the music. With a key signature, it looks so neat like this. Remember that in treble clef, we always write the F sharp sign on the highest line, not the lower spaced one. In the bass clef, we write the F sharp on the fourth line counting from the bottom, Remember, in this example, all Fs should be F-sharps, not only the one on the top line in treble clef, or the fourth line of the bass clef. Let's listen to some music in G major. Let's move on to D major now. In D major, we encounter two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. The key signature looks like this. Let's listen to some music in D major. Lastly, let's take a look in F major, which has one flat, B flat. The flat is written on the middle line in the treble clef. In the bass clef, 
the flat is written on the second line from the bottom. If a piece of music was written with notes mainly from the F major scale, which are F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F, the piece is in F major. Let's listen to some music in F major. Key signatures play a vital role in determining the overall mood and character of a piece. Each major key has its unique flavor, adding variety and interest to the musical landscape. So next time you listen to or play music, pay attention to the key signature, and you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the artistry behind it. Interval is an essential concept in understanding and analyzing melodies, chords, and harmonies. In music theory, an interval refers to the distance between two pitches or notes. It is measured by the number of letter names. Intervals can be classified into two main types, melodic intervals and harmonic intervals. Melodic intervals are played sequentially one after another, while harmonic intervals are played simultaneously. As mentioned earlier, numbers are used to describe intervals. For example, the interval between C and E is called a third, because it spans three letter names, C, D, E. Similarly, the interval between C and D is called a second, because it spans two letter names, C, D. Now can you tell the number of this interval? Yes, it's a sixth. From C to A, there are six letter names. The picture below shows intervals that are based on the C major scale. The first one from middle C to the same middle C is called a unison. The last one goes from middle C to another higher C is an octave. Now let's go further to see different chord qualities. What do you mean by chord qualities? It means major, minor, perfect, augmented, and diminished. They all have symbols to represent their qualities. For example, in a C major scale, we can build up an interval based on each note. The first one is in unison. The second one from C to D is a major second. The third one from C to E is the major third. For the fourth and fifth, we call them perfect fourth and perfect fifth. Next is a major six and a major seventh. This formula is the same for any other major scales. In minor scale, the method of counting numbers is the same as major, however, the quality of some intervals changed. For example, the interval of third, sixth, and seventh are slightly altered with a semitone smaller, it becomes minor third, minor sixth, and minor seventh respectively. The unison, major second, perfect fourth, and perfect fifth stay the same. For augmented intervals, it is a semitone higher in a perfect or major interval. Let's take a perfect fifth as an example. From C to G, it is a perfect fifth. However, if we raise the G to a semitone higher, to G sharp, the interval is made a semitone bigger. It becomes an augmented fifth. Another example here from C to D is a major second. If the D is raised to a semitone higher to D sharp, it can be named as an augmented second. Diminished intervals are one semitone smaller than a perfect or minor interval. For example, from C to G is a perfect fifth. If we lower the G to G flat, the interval becomes a semitone smaller. It is a diminished fifth. Here is another example of diminished interval. From C to A flat is a minor sixth. If we lower the A flat to a semitone lower, it becomes a double flat. In music theory, triads and diatonic chords play a crucial role for establishing harmony and structure. At the end of this video, you will be able to identify the quality and realize the function of certain diatonic chords, which is a very important aspect in harmony. First, let's dive in the tonic triad. Triads are three note chords. Tonic triads are formed by stacking two intervals of a third on top of a tonic note. For example, to build a C major tonic triad, we start by writing the first note of the scale, C. Then, we add a third from C to E, and another third from E to G, and it creates a tonic triad. So here's how it works. Tonic triads are built on the first, third, and fifth of the scale degrees in the same key. With the same logic, you can create a tonic triad in any major and minor key. Now, can you tell what the tonic triad of D major is? 
Yes, you are right. The notes are D, F sharp, and A, corresponding to the first, third, and fifth degree of the D major scale, respectively. Now we will go through how to label chords. To designate chords in music, we always used Roman numerals. For example, in C major scale, if a chord is built from the first degree of the scale, it is referred to as chord one or tonic. The labels for all chords based on C major scale are listed below. They are also known as diatonic scale and chords. Note that in all major scales, chord 1, 4, 5 are always in major quality, which is why we use capital Roman numerals here. Chord 2, 3, and 6 are in minor quality, so we used lowercase here. Chord 7 is a diminished chord, hence we use a small circle to represent it. At this moment, it is very important for you to understand why we need to learn these things in music theory. It is the function of chords. In harmony, tonic chord is always very stable. It doesn't have any tendency to move. Subdominant chord has a slight tendency to move forward. Dominant chord has a very strong tendency to move forward. That's why you always hear the chord is followed by the tonic. In the advanced level of music theory, you will study chord progression like this, and what you need to know is the function of each chord. By understanding triads and diatonic chords, musicians can create melodic and harmonic progressions that are pleasing to the ear and convey specific emotions. These concepts serve as building blocks for further exploration and understanding of music theory. That's all for this lesson. See you.